Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ellie. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Ellie. Hey, everyone. It's good to be here. Good to be sober today. I only have 10 minutes, so I'm going to make this quick. Uh, I want to start with today. Um, today, uh, Yesterday, I got a text from my old landlord saying she's moving out of her house that she's lived in for 20 years, and I lived there with her in 2014, 2015, and uh, I was so excited. I was so excited to to go over there and see her and catch up. And a few months ago, up until a few months ago, I was so afraid of her. She was the number one person in my life. If I ever saw her in a grocery store, I would have never gone to that grocery store again. I ran away from that housing situation. I said I'd move out in two days. I moved out in one day. Um, I literally thought she was a witch and she was going to hurt me. She never did anything. I was just so full of fear at the time. And that was the beginning of my career of drinking by myself. And a few months ago, I made amends to her. And that's what this was all about. Like, I wouldn't have ever wanted to see her again if it wasn't for AA. And now we have this relationship that we never have had before. So that was pretty, pretty awesome today. Um, I'm here because I'm a drunk. I'm still here because I've been working the steps, I think. And I have some concept of a higher power. Uh, when I came to AA, I didn't think it would work for me because it involved me. And I had already tried to quit drinking on my own, and it didn't work. Um, by the end, I was a maintenance drinker. I was a daily drinker. I had rules about not drinking during the day. I broke those rules. I you know, would call in sick so I could drink during the day. I felt like the world owed me something. I felt like no one could understand me. I reached a point where I couldn't remember what I used to like to do or um, how people went to the grocery store sober or why people walked around Lake Merritt. And, or like, I just couldn't, I just like felt like I wasn't a person anymore. And so I decided to check out AA. Uh, I didn't think it'd work for me, but I tried it. On March 4th of last year, I went to Brickley Fellowship for a Saturday night meeting. And I heard people say, oh, I hit bottom at 35, I hit bottom at 40, and I was 25 at the time, and I was like, good, I have time. (laughs) Clearly, you know, it could be worse. I I haven't been arrested. I've almost been arrested. Um, You know, I haven't gotten a DUI, but I don't have to drive in the bay. So things could be worse, and I didn't think I was ready to stop. The whole time I was in that meeting, I thought about what liquor store I'd go to next. And it couldn't be the one where the other night the guy asked me if I was okay because I was, you know, buying a steel reserve and I was already drunk and I was by myself and it was 10 p.m. and all that stuff. Um, And then after the meeting, I started talking to some women who were there. I picked up my newcomer literature. I found myself not wanting to leave the room because once I left, I didn't have a choice anymore. And I knew that. And we went to fellowship after, and that's never happened at Berkeley Fellowship since that day. And that's, like, the weirdest thing to me. Like, just some weird, like, higher power situations going on. Um, And uh, they asked me why I was there, which is a question I like to ask newcomers now, because that really got me to think about my drinking, which was something I never, ever talked about with anyone, ever, ever. Um... And I said, you know, I I think I have a problem with drinking, but I don't think I'm ready to stop. And I said, I can't see myself going home tonight without going to a liquor store first. I can't see. That person in my head, me, I can't see her doing that. And when I said it, they were all like, yeah, me too. Like, that's how I was. I never thought I'd hear that from anyone. That was like my secret. And um, the picture in my head changed to someone who was happier and more hopeful. And I, without a shadow of a doubt, I have 11 months sober, a little over 11 months. Like, that's the person who's been here. That's the person um, 
I've been able to be in AA is like that person who was okay going home without taking a drink. And that night I didn't go back out to the liquor store. I had a solid 30 minute window where I could have done that. And I went to sleep. And the next morning I went to a meeting and that night I went to another meeting. An old timer walked past me in a meeting once that first week. He wasn't even talking to me. And I heard him say, it's the greatest honor to have someone ask me to sponsor them. And I was like, oh, okay. It's not an inconvenience. These people are weird. Like, (laughs) cool. Uh, I guess I'll try that. I never was the person to try asking for help ever, ever, ever. Um, So I asked someone I met at my first meeting to sponsor me, and we started working the steps that weekend. And they told me, they suggested I go to a meeting every day for 90 days, and I did that. Uh, They suggested I call them every day. I did that. I reached out to newcomers. Anyone who had less time than me was a newcomer, was someone I could share my experience with. Um, And I just kind of kept going. I actually went to a meeting every day my first seven months, And on the day of my seven months, I went on a plane to Portugal for 10 days, traveling by myself, where I got really familiar and intimate with the first step all over again, Um, because I discovered I had this idea in my head that, um, yeah, people talk about the first drink, the first drink, like that one drink, I can't take that one drink. And I was starting to think, what about like a sip? What about, like, this for sentimental value or something? (laughs) And uh, luckily, a fellow had given me an issue of the grapevine that was on sober travel. It was such a weird coincidence. Um, And and so I had that, and I I knew that I had to remember what it was like. And I'm so grateful that I, I didn't drink on that trip. And not only that, but because I worked the steps, like, I was on my ninth step by that point, I was actually able to be by myself and be totally at peace. I was fine. And that was, that's been one of the greatest gifts. I don't feel that all the time. I don't feel great all the time. I have areas in my life where, uh, apparently my higher power is not in charge. Uh, so I think, and so I get to feel pain over and over and do things differently eventually, hopefully. And, um, today, um, I told you literally about today, but today I'm, I try to be of service. I sponsor a couple women. One of them canceled on me last minute today. I had the choice of what I was going to do next and how I was going to react. And uh, I'm just really grateful to be sober today, and thanks for letting me share. Hi, my name's Kevin, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Kevin. It's good to be clean and sober today. And uh, I always feel an honor whenever anybody asks me to come and speak at a meeting. There was a time when nobody even wanted me around. (laughs) So that's the truth. Uh, So I don't know. I guess everybody always wants to know how long a person has been sober. So by the grace of God and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, that's that's heartfelt. Uh, I've been totally clean and sober since June 9th of 1981. And for that, I am truly grateful. And I was uh, just 23 when I got sober. So um, I spent a lot of time in young people's meetings when I first got sober. Uh, actually, this whole area here, I used to, uh, back in the 80s, uh, I used to go to a, uh, it, it was it was the oldest young people's meeting in, in, in existence, and it was over on University Avenue. It's called the Wild Bunch. And I understand, I found out tonight it's still going around, so it's still, it's still, I, I live out in Tracy, California. I moved a few times in Sobriety. I got sober in Alameda. I was in the Navy at the time. And uh, I ended up in in Alcoholics Anonymous because I had no place left to go. I never wanted to end up in Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't anything I ever aspired to try to join or anything like that. I didn't grow up thinking, you know, I'm going to be an alcoholic someday. Uh... (laughs) But I, I got there because I lost everything. I drank it all away. And that included a family, a little girl that I loved with all my heart and soul, my daughter. And I abandoned them because it was more important to party. I was a high school father and a high school husband. I, all the same wreckage. I ended up in the hospital. I got arrested a half a dozen times. 
I was born and raised in, in East Detroit. My family there, they didn't want me around. I was like a burden to them. You know, I, I, would, I would do whatever it took to get loaded on a daily basis. Lie, cheat, steal, sneak, whatever it took. Because I was a slave to it. Now, I, I was sitting here thinking about, you know, there are other things in life that I like, you know, like I like chocolate. But I don't remember the first time I took chocolate. <laughs> I remember the first time I drank. Uh, it was myself and a couple other guys. We uh, broke into the local elementary school. We stole a couple fire extinguishers. You know, didn't know what to take. We broke in there and there was a fire extinguisher. Some fire extinguishers. And, uh, and it was back in the day where you, you know, there weren't any plastic bottles, they were glass bottles, right? You could take them to the store and you'd get some coin. And so we went and took them to the local Kmart that morning. We got some coin. And then we went over to 7 Eleven and we started asking people to each to buy us. Uh, it was when that Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill wine first came out. And uh, this old wino came by and we each got a bottle. We bought the wine old bottle. And we went out to this field. And we started shooting those fire extinguishers off at each other. And we were laughing and we were having a good time. We were drinking that Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill wine. And right in the middle of that, for the very first time in my life, I felt like I was okay and the world was okay. And up until that point, I didn't feel like I ever belonged anywhere. Not even with my own family. I just, I always felt like I was a fish out of water, like I was just sort of ill-equipped for life. Like other people kind of knew what was going on, I didn't have a clue. And I was kind of like a chameleon who would try to fit in, I would act. If I was with this group of people, I'd act one way, as I was with this group of people, I'd act another way, just to try to fit in. And I was, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, a person who was um, always in conflict with others, because like I could be with, uh, you know, I could be with a group of people. Uh, someone was talking about physics to, before the meeting. I could be with a group of mathematicians, and I wouldn't even know anything about it. But I'd listen to them for five minutes, and then I'd be talking to talk, and I'd be telling them how to do it, and then I'd be arguing with them, you know, because I was just kind of like a clueless idiot like that. Uh, but you know, it was. I didn't know, I, like I said, I was ill-equipped for life. But uh, that, uh, that Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill wine made me feel like I was okay. And the world was okay. And I thought I found the answer to life in it. And I, I swore to myself that I was gonna, I was gonna do this every single day. And I chased it, and I chased it hard. And it, you know, it, you know, eventually uh, I had gotten to the point where it was a, a daily basis. I was, I, I got to the point where I was just hoping to die. I would, I, you know, I, I was selling my plasma every other day just to get a few bucks to get drunk. Uh, man, I, I'd wake up in the morning, and the first thing out of my mouth, I'd, I'd drop the f bomb. I'd be angry. Because I'd have to get loaded again today, and I didn't know how that was going to happen. Because I was broke all the time. I was, I was the world's worst dope dealer. I'd do everything. i get fronted something, thinking I was going to make this money, right? And I'd do it all, and then old people. You know, so I did, did stuff like that. And so it became a really hard job to get loaded on a daily basis. But I would find a way. <coughs> By hook or crook find a way. And then about, you know, say 10 o'clock at night or something, I'd be staring into the bottom of a glass thinking, man, this stuff is killing me and I hope I don't wake up. And it was like that. It was like this endless cycle. I can remember, distinctly remember, doing things like walking through the door of a bar thinking, I'm just going to have a couple. <laughs> and then, you know, about eight later, I'd be pounding on the bar how the hell did I get this way again? And the next thing would be, you know, screw it. 
use the, use the F word. <laughs> and uh, then I noticed, you know, the lights would flicker on and off, last call. I spent all the money I had. Uh, to think how, you know, what, what, what will I do now? And it was like this endless cycle. Anyhow, uh, I got, like I said, I got busted about a half a dozen times. I ended up joining the Navy once because I got busted in Cedar Point, Ohio, on an amusement park ride. Yeah, they kept it. I was smoking dope up to that. They just kept the ride going until the police showed up. I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm out there thinking, man, I'm getting my money's worth. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Anyhow, uh, this is uh, 1978, and uh, the Vietnam War had just ended. And there weren't a lot of people joining the military back then. As a matter of fact, they didn't look at people in the military back then the way they look at them now. The attitudes were completely different. Uh, anyhow, uh, they gave me a choice. Either I do 18 months in jail or I go speak to one of those three recruiters in the back of the room. <laughs> and uh, that's how I ended up in the military. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, in less than a year, I got busted. Uh, I was in a station in Hawaii and, uh, and they sent me to my very first rehab. I ended up going to two rehabs, uh, but they sent me to my very first rehab, and it was in that rehab that I, uh, they had an A meeting that would come on base, actually. There's probably about as many people here tonight as there was in this AA meeting, and it was, it was there for the very first time in my life that I admitted outward what I had known inward. I, I, you know, I knew I, 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 I was an alcoholic. They say the alcoholic's the last person to know. No. I had those moments of clarity, and I looked out in the future, and I didn't see I had any. You know, I, I was kind of knew I was going to end up being the skid row bum. You know, that I didn't have a future, and uh, but then I blotted out my drink. I, I was a blackout drinker, and I looked for oblivion all the time. And uh, anyhow. Uh, I mean, I was an alcoholic in this meeting, and it was like a ton of bricks was lifted right off my shoulders. But the truth is, is I wasn't, I wasn't ready because I still wanted to smoke dope. I couldn't at twenty two, as twenty two at the time, I couldn't figure out now, how how do you get laid without smoking dope? So, uh, you know, and so I get out of the rehab, and this is how long it took me to get back to drinking. I went, you know, and then I was right back at it. You know. Uh, but about a year and a half later, uh, I hit bottom, and, and you talked about uh, not knowing how to ask for help. I didn't know how to ask for help. I was, uh, by this time, I was stationed out of NASL Mita on, on a ship called the USS Coral Sea. It was an aircraft carrier. And uh, I was pacing back and forth on the pier. And I was all out of ideas. I always had ideas in my head that if only this, this, and this would happen, everything would be okay. There's a little line in, in the big book that I just love. It, it says that it is a delusion that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this life if only I manage well. And I was trying to manage my life. You know, and... Uh, it was my managing my life that got me here to begin with. And I had run a whole lot of ideas. And, uh, and I had uh, some pipes in my pocket, some papers, a little bit of hash, and uh, about, about a swallow left in this pint that I had in my back pocket. And I walked up the prow of the ship, and I just started taking everything out of my pockets and handing it to the master at arms. And I put my arms out like this for him to put the cuffs on. And as he was leading me away to the brig, I felt happy. I did. I didn't know how to ask for help, so that's how I asked for help. I, I actually surrendered at that moment. It wasn't my last drunk. Uh, and, and we left the next morning. They sailed down to San Diego, and that was my last drunk. And I learned a very valuable lesson down there. As we got up in the morning... I hadn't been to Captain's Mass yet, and that's military court for people who don't know. And, uh, you know, they only kept me in the brig for the night. And uh, anyhow, we get, we, we get, we pull in the port, and I find myself looking at myself in the mirror. 
and I hated every fabric of my being. I just hated myself. And I wasn't going to drink just for that day. Just one day, I wasn't going to drink. And uh, <clears throat> about 7 o'clock at night, I'm standing there on Coronado Island, and I'm thinking, man, I'm just bored. I'm bored out of my mind. I don't know what to do with myself. And so I, I'm thinking, you know, I start counting myself, like, you know, how we tell ourselves lies, and we set ourselves up for that first drink. You know, I tell myself, well, I'll just go downtown. Uh, I used to go to the gentlemen's clubs a lot, and uh, I, 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 t I told myself, I wouldn't actually go in the bar. I'd just kind of peek my head in there and see, <laughs> see if I could see the girls dancing or something, you know. And... Uh, here I am lying to myself, setting myself up for that first drink. Well, I got in the cabbie, and the cabbie said, hey, how would you like to meet a nice lady? And he handed me a joint, and here I went, and I was drinking again. And that, la that last drunk lasted like three days. And, uh, and when I got back to the ship, totally broke. I didn't even know where I was in San Diego. I, I conned her and taking me back to the ship. I tell her I had more money on the ship. And, uh, and I sunk up against my locker. And out of, the, out of myself, from way deep down within, I said that prayer that we, uh, we hear a lot of people say around here when they hit bottom. I said, well, God, if you're really there, please help me. And I know now that, you know, I can't do one without doing the other. And that was a truth that came from way deep down inside of me. And the truth is, and I didn't believe in, in God. Well, I was kind of indifferent, to be honest with you, but I was very uh, anti-religious and very rebellious, you know. So I didn't want anything to do with no God, but that prayer came out of me. And when we got back up to Alameda, the, the counselor on board the ship, between the, that time and we got back, you know, he, he had me in his office. You'll see this, uh, if any of you do H&I work, there's a little pink, pink sheet that says the 20 questions. And he gave me the 20 questions. And I got like 18 of them right, so I passed. <laughs> <laughs> passed the test. Anyhow, uh, this, this counselor took me, he had five years so in sobriety at the time. He took me to my first meeting and they all meet in there uh, over at the Island Fellowship in Alameda. That's where I got sober. And we rolled up to that meeting, and Mr. Bojangles was playing on the radio, and I could identify. We walked in that meeting, and they sit in long cafeteria-style tables here. And I sat down there and asked if anybody was new. My name's Kevin. I'm an alcoholic. And I sat there, and I listened. And as it went around, like everybody was a lot older than me. At that time, there wasn't too many people coming in from my age at that time. And uh, these people were sharing, and they were saying things about themselves that I could really identify with. I did all the same things, felt the same kind of loneliness. Some guy said that he was an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. I'm thinking, how did he know that about me? <laughs> you know, he's talking about himself. And they came around, and, you know, he came around to this lady who sat right across from me. And with all the love, care, and concern in her heart, she looked at me and said, you know, I don't think you'll make it. He's too young. But I was identifying with everybody. And for the very first time in my life, I felt like I was in a place where I belonged. I never felt that before. I belong. Now, I was afraid to talk to people in AA at first because the truth is, if I started talking to you guys, you'd get to know me. And once you got to know me, you wouldn't like me. And then you'd say, hey, there's the door, sucker, hit it. <laughs> and so I did a lot of eavesdropping, you know, especially after meetings. People would be in the front room there and they'd be talking be a couple guys saying some good things. I'd be listening. They, if they turned around to talk to me, I'd walk away. <laughs> and then one day, I'm sitting out there in the front room after a meeting, trying to be a part of a wall, right? And this old timer comes up to me and says, Come here. 
And so okay. I follow them like a like a, a dog with a tail between its legs or something. I'm thinking they're gonna kick me out. <laughs> you know, they finally had enough of me. And it was always surprising to me when people would say, keep coming back, I'd be kind of looking around. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh so uh, this guy walks me over to the sink counter. You could smoke in meetings back then. It was full of ashtrays and dirty coffee cups. He says, here, you can wash these. <laughs> and I'm thinking, they're not going to kick me out. And they're trusting me to do this. <laughs> Nobody trusted me in a long time. People didn't want me around. Not even like my oldest road dog who I started drinking and using with back in Michigan. I can remember being on leave one time. And uh, going over his house, I had a 12-pack of beer, and I had a bag of dope. And I go, I'm go, i going up to the front door of his house, and I can hear the music going. And I can hear the TV on. And I, bam, bam, bam. The music goes off. The TV goes off. <laughs> and nobody comes through the door. <laughs> so, you know, that's where I was at. Man, nobody wanted me around. And I didn't like myself. And I was sure you guys wouldn't, wouldn't want me around either. But I was, I was just so surprised. But, you know, and I tell people all the time, uh, man, if you take this program right to heart, you can't go wrong. And that's what I did. I found something real in AA for the first time in my life, and it was real. Nobody would bullshit me. And the crowd I, I hung out with, we bullshitted each other all the time. If our lips were moving, we were lying. And yeah, I was getting the truth. And that meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me. It didn't matter if it pissed me off or not. I wanted the truth. And they gave it to me, and they gave it to me straight. And, you know, some of them were kind of assholes about it, but some, most of them weren't. Most of them were very kind and tolerant to me. You know, they knew I was crazy. They knew I was very sick. You know, and, and I'll just say something about that because, like, I that, I used to think my, my problem was that I was crazy. I was more afraid of getting found out about that, you know, because I kind of figured the guys with the white coats and the big net would come get me. I'd never get out. But uh, I was, I, uh, anyhow, uh, I, when I found out that I was sick, that I had a disease, it was a relief. I was relieved. Anyhow, I started hearing things in AA that was just so real. And, and I had this uh, guy, his name, they, they called him Little Lloydy. Uh, he was a funny little guy. And uh, Lloyd became my friend. And uh, he used to take me, we were talking about this place. <coughs> There's a place called the Ashkenaz. And uh, he used to take me in early sobriety up there to go dance and show me how to have fun in sobriety. Some people were talking about a dance. He'd take me around to the Milano clubs. He showed me how to have fun in sobriety. And he became my friend. And, uh, you know, he really tricked me into becoming my sponsor. <laughs> I didn't know that was what was going on. But, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, after a short while, he started opening up the book and says, hey, man, check this out. There's some really good stuff here. You know, and so before I knew it, we're working the steps on the big book, and we're really into. He was a huge twelve step. We got into twelve step work a lot of times back then. You know, from the hotline. You know, we would get calls on the hotline every day, and we'd go out to houses or hotels or something like that. You know, bring some pamphlets. And, uh, you know, and and he 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 got me and he got me involved and. That became so fulfilling. Because when I was out there using and boozing, the truth is, is, towards the end, I just felt like I was taking up space and I was waiting to die. <clears throat> you know? And uh, this gave me purpose. Not like we were out trying to rescue anybody. Because he, he, he taught me right. You know, we were doing this for ourselves. And it felt good. It felt like I was doing something that counts in life, which I didn't do anything to count. My life meant nothing until that. And I, I, I ain't saying it was a big deal or nothing, but at least it counted for something. I mean, I can remember when I was drinking and stuff, 
uh, you know, feeling sorry for myself, like my life didn't mean anything. And my, my father had bought a $5,000 life insurance policy for me when I, when I got married and, and, had, and we had our child. Like I said, it was in high school at the time. And, you know, that marriage lasted a year because I drank it away. And, uh, and I, I can remember being in the car in the winter and the roads, there's snow and sometimes the roads are icy up there in Michigan, right? And I was thinking, man, if this car in front of me swerves a little bit, I can drive my car off into that ditch and hit that telephone pole and kill myself. My daughter will get that money. But then my life will have meant at least something. And, you know, that car swerved and I didn't have the courage to do it. You know, that's the kind of life I was in. But so here, you know, when it talks about it in, 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 in the big book, our lives will have meaning at last. This is what I was experiencing. And Lloyd was involved in H and I, and he had this meeting uh, over at the Salvation Army in Oakland, and uh, we would go over there, and uh, he let me sit in on that and participate a little later. And so I got involved in H and I right away, and uh, and it, and you know it's funny. Uh, you reminded me of something that you were talking about. Uh, I, the first time I, I traveled away, I was probably about about 60 days sober, sometime around then. And uh, and I flew, I was flying back to Michigan to see my folks. And I, I'm on the plane, you know, they had those little bottles of liquor. And they're passing around, I'm thinking, man, who would know? And then the next thought was, I would know. So I was like, you know, this this broken brain of mine will lie to me. But I can, I can, you know, I can override that with the truth. If, I, if I'm brutally honest with myself. And I would know. And so I, I don't want to cheat myself no more. So I don't want to lie to myself. And, and I was very happy on that second might not be responsible for that first thought, but I can be responsible for that second And so anyhow, uh, I started growing in AA by leaps and bounds at first. Uh, we're going through the steps. I'm, I'm learning all kinds of things, and I'm, and I'm making amends. And those people that I'd harmed, my family and everybody, uh, it's kind of like, you know how if if anybody reads about Dr. Bob, he started out mending fences right away. I was like that, you know, uh, and uh, I mean, I was I was really I really wanted to make things right. I didn't know if anybody was going to forgive me or let me back into your life or anything, but I wanted to make things right. So I started doing that, and uh, lo and behold, people did. My daughter's mother didn't at first. I could have used some guidance in there, but I didn't do that. I kind of was just doing it on my own. I, we did, we had Lloyd and I hadn't got up to those immense steps yet when I started doing this, and I opened up some old wounds. And so that that wasn't very smart of me, but uh, I learned a, learned a valuable lesson about that, and uh, and it cost me because I didn't really. Get to see see my daughter much at all until after you know about three years of sobriety. But uh, she did eventually come back into my life. And uh, anyhow, I had moved from Alameda over to Katai, uh, which is up by Petaluma. And uh, one thing I discovered uh, was I, I noticed this before I moved that. A lot of times when people move, you know, they don't like the meetings where they move to. They, you know, they don't do it the same. So. And they end up getting drunk. Me, I found myself running back, driving back from Katani to go to meetings in Alameda every night. It's like, this is crazy. That's insane. You know, and so uh, eventually I, I uh, kind of got mad at myself and I, I did what I was taught to do. I threw myself in the 12-step work. 
I was going to be the very first person at the meeting when the newcomer was there to go shake their hand. I was going to offer to you know, sponsor people. I got involved in, with H&I up there. I was taking meetings to, to the Honor Farm up in Santa Rosa, a couple other places. And uh, it was like the big book talks about, the fellowship just kind of like grew up around me. And so I, I lived up there for about six years, and then I moved to Texas. And I, I took this job in Texas, and I remember uh, I interviewed for it, and, and they told me I could have the job, but it's contingent upon me moving to Texas. And my first thought was, Texas? Who the hell would want to live in Texas? But they said to me, and, hey, be open-minded. So uh, they were going to see it, see if... They were going to send me on a see if you like San Antonio trip, you know? and and so I looked in the in the back of the grapevine, and and back then uh, they would list all the A conferences on the last couple of pages of grapevine, and also on the back cover actually. And I saw that they were having this conference in San Antonio, so I said I'll go down there this weekend. And I go down there to San Antonio. I'm, I'm at this conference and. And uh, lo and behold, I found out their love. I uh, ended up moving just west of there, into the Texas Hill Country. And you hear stories about, like, you know, that alcoholic who lives in some little town. He's the only one that's there. Uh, you know, just keeps it open in case anybody comes. I met that guy. <laughs> His name was Justin. He's an old biker. Justin's a good friend of mine. And for... Uh, a little while there, he and I were the only ones in that meeting. But he would, he was there he was, every night. He'd go to this little little place. It was uh, owned by the Methodist Church, a little house actually. And it had uh, had like uh, uh, bees' nests and stuff, wasps' nests, wasps nests, and, and they had to run the water a long time. To turn from brown to clear. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Justin and I, uh, we had meetings there together. We became good friends. We started doing things like taking meetings into the, into the county jail there in Bandera, Texas. Threw ourselves into 12 step work. And again, just like the big book talks about, it's like a fellowship grew up around me. So I lived down there for 17 years. And then uh, in, in, in the fall of 2010, uh, I got a, another job offer that was contingent upon me moving to California. So I ended up living out in Tracy. Now, uh, when my daughter was 13 years old, I was living up in Catania. She asked me one day, she said, you know, Dad, uh, she, she, we'd started seeing each other. She'd gone to some AA meetings with me. She'd gone to Alex. And one day she says, Dad, you know, Mom's drinking a gallon of vodka a week. She's smoking all this dope. Can I come live with you? And so I got to do the single parent thing for a while. And... Uh, you know, it's a beautiful thing because, you know, she's she's going to be 42 here next month. And got a couple grandchildren. And I get to watch them all by myself. And this was a little girl I abandoned. You know, and she's back in my life because of alcohol. It's not. It's because of this program, because of those amend steps. I tell people all the time, the amend steps are the steps that heal. And i got to keep an eye on the time. Ten minutes. Oh, good. Thank you. Because, okay. <laughs> like, you know, I could talk about this stuff for a long time, man. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. But when you've been around a while, you get stories. I got lots of stories, man. Anyhow, so I moved out, out, out here to Tracy, California, and I knew what to do right away. And I got myself involved in H&I. And uh, I'm very involved in H&I. I love it. And I got a, I got a good fellowship up there that, that I'm, I'm, I'm a member of, and I and I always have a commitment there. Uh, it's Recovery Central. It's in, it's in uh, Tracy there on Eleventh Street, and uh, I made really good friends, really good 
friends. He came down here with you tonight. We've become real good friends. And uh, we, we, we've done some age and I work together. And, and I find it so rewarding. My life does have meaning. I, I can remember uh, one time, I, this is when I was living in San Antonio, I was in this clean and sober motorcycle club at the time. And uh, I found myself upside down <laughs> one day. And they, and, you know, they don't have a helmet law there, and I, I wasn't wearing a helmet. And I'm riding along on my head. And a lot of things go through your mind really quick. And one of those things was, uh, well, if this is it, if I die today, I'm really kind of okay. Because I've made all those amends. And those people know that I love them. And they love me. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, sure, I miss my, my grandchildren, my daughter. But I'd be okay. If I went out today, I'd be okay. And that wasn't true the day I walked through the door of AA. Because the truth of the matter is, when I walked through the door of AA, I kind of accepted the fact that I was going to die. I didn't think I would live through the winter. I thought I was going to go up to Captain's Mass. They were going to kick me out of the Navy, and I would die penniless and homeless, you know, full of shame. And that's that was it. That was going to be it. And, 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 you know, I just accepted that. And I could picture in my mind's eye, you know, people from my family might go to my funeral. And if they did, they might say kind of under their breath, or maybe even out loud, they might say, you know, there's nothing but a drunken bum, and we're better off without him. And they've been right. Couldn't argue with that. And all I wanted out of Alcoholics Anonymous was a shredded dignity. I wanted to go out clean and sober, even if nobody else knew. But I had no idea how good my life was going to turn out. I met a wonderful woman in NAA, and we got married. And, uh, you know, she puts up with me. She loves me. She loves me. She's never had it so good. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, and, and like I said, my daughter and my grandchildren, they live out here, so it's nice for me to come back here. That I get to be a part of their lives. You know, and uh, I've gotten to travel a lot in AA. I've gotten to be, like I said, I was very involved in young people's. So I was a, for about five years there. I got to be on a on a committee, uh, Akipop. I don't know if anybody, if you all know, but I was on the Akipop committee and got conference come, come to San Francisco back in the early nineties. And uh, I went to a lot of those conventions, and all over the state of California because I was on the Akipop committees too. I, was, I used to hang out with a bunch of bunch of uh, bunch of the, the, the most active ones. That I was uh, hanging out with were out in like Concord area. So, back then, anyhow. But uh, made a lot of friends. Good friends, real friends. Not those good time Charlies. You know? And what was more important is I learned how to be a real friend. Not that selfish, self centered guy that was just out for himself to you know, act it on self will. I've got tools today to help me out to live my life. I, I told you before I didn't have a clue about what life was about. Today I do. I didn't know who I was. It may sound kind of funny to you, but I didn't know who I was. And I came in today and I found out who I was. It was actually I misread something out of <coughs> out of a story in the big book. It's called uh, Freedom from Bondage. And uh, it's not in there, what I misread. <laughs> but uh, I misread it, and, and what, what, I, what, I, what I thought I, I read was uh, that I was a direct reflection of every situation that I ever reacted to. And the moment that hit me, it's like, oh, yeah, that's who I am. That, you know, I looked at how I reacted to stuff in life, and it's usually too extreme. You know? And I was very, very quick. Quick on the trigger, you know. Very judgmental. And, uh, you know, the steps, 
the steps, you know, they <coughs> humbled me. Each one, and I approached each one as if there was not another one ahead of that. You know, so I was really kind of like staying in that step. You know, so really. Anyhow, uh, I said to somebody I was going to tell this story. Uh, when we, when he, when I was asked to come to this part of town to speak, you know, I hadn't been over here since the eight nineteen eighties over in this area. But uh, I used to um, back in the early eighties there was there was one of my mentors was this guy by the name of Joe W. And Joe had uh, started this meeting at a church, which I believe was on Thirty Second San Pablo. It's on the corner there, in my caddy corner from there. There used to be this park. And all the wine notes are drinking the park and stuff. And anyhow, Joe had a friend uh, that owned a, a Winchell's Donuts. I don't even know if they're around anymore. But uh, he used to get these day-old stale donuts. And uh, we'd go in and make coffee and bring those donuts. And all the wine notes kind of shuffle in in the morning, get a cup of coffee and a donut, right? And he asked me to come chair the meeting. In one of those times, uh, done with the meeting, and he's kind of locking it up, turns me, looks at me, and says, you know, I can always tell when they're getting better because they start complaining about the donuts. <laughs> <laughs> so coming over here, you know, I mean, it really uh, kind of did my heart good. It brought some things floating back to me. And uh, again, I love alcoholics, and I was kind of, Thank God he would let me hang around. My life is, it has been brilliant since I've been sober. Not, not that it hasn't had some tough times. But I found, I discovered, like a lot of others have, during those tough times, I throw myself in the 12 steps. It works when all other activities fail. It get, it's got me through. All right, thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.